Okay, is everyone here? Can you hear me? Excellent. Okay, so um, at one point in time, there was a list of talks that people wanted, and one of them was jQuery. And apparently, it falls to me to give this talk. <laughs> so, so that's cool. Um, I give a lot of jQuery talks to JavaScript audiences. And to those audiences, I mainly talk about jQuery. I'm assuming a couple things here. Um, you already know that you should be using jQuery. Um, so I'm not going to try to sell you on jQuery. Uh, there's actually talks online that uh, exist in which I sell you on jQuery. So I'm going to assume that. Um, and I assume that you're more interested in hearing about like good practices for using JavaScript and jQuery with Merb. Um, and possibly why Merb doesn't do it the way Rails does it. And not so much like intro JavaScript things. So I'm going to start by showing you. So I heard every, every so often when I'm talking about JavaScript and Merb, I hear Rails makes it so easy. It's so fantastic. We should use RJS. Why don't we have RJS? Why don't we have Remote Form 4, et cetera? So I'm going to go through how that works and why it's not good. Um, and why we do what we do, and then how to go about using jQuery the way that I do personally do it and the way I know a lot of people do it, best practices. So here's the sort of thing you see in Rails, something like this. And it actually looks really clean. So it's like, oh, make a remote form for. Um, just a, a aside, so in order for me to collect some of the information I need to make here, I went back into Rails land, and I had to actually figure out how this works. And it turns out that we've been beating ourselves up a lot about user friendliness, and this is not easy to figure out how to do. Like maybe you could, maybe there's a book somewhere that teaches you how to do it, but Google was failing me in a big way. Just like how are you supposed to use Remote Form for? In part because it makes a lot of assumptions about the things you pass in. Like if this is a user, this is an object that is an Active Record object, and if it doesn't, it just gives you an error that's completely indecipherable. It's like cannot find brackets on nil, which. <laughs> Isn't helpful. So, and it's the same thing with link to. Like, there's a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of URL-like helpers, and URLs magically appear because of the new way that Rails likes to assume that you always mean to make URLs out of things. Um, and so, there's it was not as easy. I feel like I've been beating myself up too much about making it really easy because there were some things there that that weren't. Um, but I guess if you're the biggest bestest, uh, you get to claim that anything. So. So here we are. So, so here's the form. So here's how it works. And here's the JavaScript that gets spit out, uh, something like this. And there's some things that you might notice here, like once upon a time we, sorry, once upon a time we did this, and we stopped doing that. Right? And we stopped doing that because it turns out that putting things like that, like font face, or on click equals into your page makes it very hard to maintain. And there's sort of this claim that, well, it works, so stop complaining. Why are you looking at your HTML source? It obviously works. And it kind of works. It's kind of true. But here's sort of the, the life cycle of a Rails project. So you start off and you're like, wow, remote form 4, that's great. It's so easy. I can just don't even need to know JavaScript at all. And it's like, oh, I need an autocompleter. Wow, there's a plug in it. Ready, works, it's great. And then it's like, wow, RJS, what is this JavaScript thing? It just, everything's great. And then one day you run into, you know, your boss comes in and he says, we need an autocompleter that talks to a web service. And you're like, yikes, right? <laughs> and then it's like, got to learn JavaScript. It's time to learn JavaScript, right? So that doesn't, so it kind of works. It's kind of true that there's things in Rails that get you, I don't know, I, don't, I think 80% is probably overstating the case. But they get you somewhere. But when you get past the point where you're pretending like you don't have to know, nobody on your team has to know any JavaScript, which is basically where you are, you end up here, right? You end up, uh, I guess we have to learn JavaScript over the weekend, right? And that just doesn't, that's not really, that's not really the way. Um, the alternative is to have a more state, a steady, yes, I needed to make some kind of fake graph here. But to have a more steady <laughs> uh, difficulty stream. So yes, there's an initial, you've got to hire someone who knows JavaScript or learn JavaScript. But if you're, in, if you're in a project that is serious, like Yellow Pages, 
Um, you probably want to have someone on your team that knows the various parts of the web stack. You probably want to know HTML. You probably want to know JavaScript. And you probably want to know CSS, right? You, it's very hard to find someone who's like, oh, we're not going to use CSS. It's too hard. You know, we'll do something else. People don't really do that. And JavaScript is actually part of the web stack. It's not as bad as people think it is. I'm not going to really focus on JavaScript, the language here. Um, but getting to the point where you can do similar things with JavaScript that you could do with the helpers, it's not very hard. But you hear, like, it's hard. So, so let's take a look at what it's hard means. So what, what would you do in MERB? So that same remote form for how, what would that look like in MERB? So the first thing you would do is, is this, right? You would say form four, and then you would give it some markup, right? People have, know what unobtrusive JavaScript is, right? So this is a best practice where you say, Oh, I'm not going to try to put everything in the form that tells the behavior what to do, right? I'm going to provide enough information in my markup so that the JavaScript can figure out what to do, right? And you end up getting a form that looks like this that actually works uh, if you have no JavaScript, right? So if you submit this form, nothing crazy happens, right? And the JavaScript, which is probably really scary, is this, right? That's the JavaScript. So. Um, and yes, I'm cheating a little here because it happens to be a case where it's easy. But you're comparing it to a case that's easy, right? You're, the, the scary is, oh my god, I bet you you need a really simple case because the JavaScript for the simple case must be hard because it's JavaScript. But actually, the simple case in JavaScript is just as easy as the simple case in Ruby, except that you have to know that you need to invoke things with parentheses or whatever. Right? So you have to know that the JavaScript syntax. But if you know JavaScript syntax even vaguely, the simple stuff is simple. And then you're already in JavaScript, so when you get past the bar of the simple stuff, you can just keep extending things. It just works. Right? So let's take another example. So here's Rails. And actually, it took me like I don't know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes to figure out how to make what exactly the syntax was here. And I have used Rails before, but I guess it was a while ago. So this is what comes out. And actually, if you look here, um, there's a problem here, because it's not actually a link at all. right? It's not, not a link. It's a hash. So that's not really going to work. And um, it violates sort of what we know since like 98-ish, I think, is when people started thinking about this problem. So here's how you do it in MERB. You would say, Link to, awesome. And then you would provide a URL. And then you would say rel, which is the thing to update. And you would say class remote. This is a little, a little bit more complicated than the already everything works for you case of Ajax form. Uh, by the way, what Ajax form does is it says, oh, OK, you have a form. Um, if you click Submit on this form, just pretend that it's uh, an Ajax form. And goes and submits everything via Ajax. And if there's like files in it, it will use the iframe hack to do that. And then you can provide, um, so if I go back to that real quick. You could provide callbacks and whatnot. So if you want to do special things when, when the uh, AJAX call is done, you can provide callbacks in here. Um, but this is the equivalent of the, I just want to submit an AJAX form. So you're probably thinking, I bet you the JavaScript is crazy. It's probably, probably like 50 lines to do this. Actually, it's, it's really simple. Um, so the first thing is you say, I uh, have a CSS selector. So I said a class equals remote. Then I say, oh, did I provide a rel attribute? If so, I have an update. And then you say dollar, this.rel, if you remember, was just a CSS selector. So you just do dollar, that CSS selector, dot load, the href. Right? Otherwise, go and get it. Right? Uh, just do a regular get. And, otherwise, and then return false, which means don't actually click the link. Um, and what happens if you have no JavaScript? Right? That is actually a concern. And the answer is it's just a link. Right? So this is the real, this is the way to do it. So you're probably saying, like, oh, I really want a, a helper, a link to remote. That would be great. So link to remote, you can write like this, right? which is just make my markup. And if you switch the prototype for whatever reason, um, you can, you can write easily a helper that, uh, you can easily write the JavaScript part of it. It's longer. But um, you can write the JavaScript part of it, and then you don't have to change your markup. Right? You don't have to go in and like, figure out how to extract out the crazy markup from your markup. Uh, you don't have to be like, oh, there's probably jQuery in here somewhere. Right? It's just markup. It just says, 
right? It just says this. It's a link, right? So you can just write in whatever language. If there's some whiz bang new JavaScript library that comes out tomorrow and you want to do it, you just have to go say, oh, it's a link, and like modify it. OK, so just to sum up, um, what I'm saying is there's a thing that we know at this point. Font tags are bad. On click equals is bad. Okay? This is known. We know this since about 1998. We know that separating style from your markup is good, and we know that separating behavior from your markup is good. So if you write code that generates markup, you should write code that generates markup that is not mixed in with your behavior, just like you would not write font tags. Right? There are actually plenty of people out there, and I run into them occasionally, who say, well, font tags work. You know, tables work. It's true. Yes. You can, in fact, write entire frameworks around font tags, probably, I would assume. But you shouldn't. Right? We all know that that's a bad idea. So similarly, having 10 lines of JavaScript crammed into an on-click handler is not correct. And there are a lot of benefits, mostly the fact that you have modular code Right, you have the ability to have markup that you can easily switch JavaScript libraries out or change a little bit about the way it works without having to go in and figure out a whole bunch of code. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever looked at the source code for how Rails goes and, can, and makes the JavaScript, but it's not trivial to be like, oh, I want to change the behavior a little bit. Pretty much locked into whatever they provide or a world of hurt trying to modify those helpers because everything's abstracted. So every, every helper uses the same helpers methods that call methods. It's like methods all the way down. And so changing it is not a trivial operation. So this is, that's not the approach. The approach is to write JavaScript. Um, so the next thing I'll talk about is just something simple about how Merv works and jQuery works. So, so that's the approach in general. And then there's another thing, which is like, OK, I'm sold. We should do that. Uh, and you're like, OK, now I want to be able to talk back and forth. And I've heard about this JSON thing. How does that, how does that work with Merv? So, you probably have seen something like this. And so you have a speaker's controller. You say provide JSON, and then you say speakers equals speaker at all, display speakers. It automatically figures out whether or not you, what type of thing you want. So if you're HTML, it'll automatically try to render index.html.erb. And if you're not, if you're JSON, there won't be an index.json.erb, so it'll try to do speakers.toJSON, right? And the way this works in JavaScript land, and this is, works in prototype, I think, and definitely jQuery, is that if you ask for JSON, dollar get JSON, and you hit the URL, uh, you, it will automatically send a header accept application JSON. You don't have to do anything else. If you use the get JSON helper, or if you use the dollar at Ajax method in jQuery, and you say data type JSON, it will automatically tell Merb, I want JSON, right? which will make display speakers do the right thing. So what about RJS? Right, that's sort of the last. It's fantastic. We should write all of our JavaScript in Ruby and have it converted to JavaScript and then get eval on the client. Right, that sounds like a fantastic idea. So let's look at what's going on. And again, this again took me like 20 minutes to figure out how exactly to make RJS do something. And actually, like the only tutorials are around are from like Rails 1.1 if you like Google it. So I don't know. I'm, again, I'm sure there's a book somewhere. But I, it was hard to figure out how to do it exactly. I mean, it's, it's easy to see this, but it's hard to wire it up so that it does the right thing. So this is says page.insert.html, bottom list, content tag, li fox. And basically what this is saying is um, when, when you send, what you should send back to the client is instructions to insert at the bottom of a thing with ID list, a li containing fox. right? And what does that JS look like? It's this thing over here. Um, and what that so it does, it tells the client, hey, here's some JavaScript, eval it. So it actually sends back, it doesn't send back like HTML or something, it actually sends back a chunk of JavaScript that should be evaled on the client. And um, evaling on the client makes me personally queasy, but I, there's probably no security implications if you're not already subject to security attacks. But it just seems like sending back JavaScript to the client to get evaled is a problem. The bigger problem is just that it means that your server has to know something about client state, right? So in order to figure this out, you have to know that there's a thing with the ID of list on your page, right? And as you get more complicated, like you're like, oh, I'm going to add something. And then I'm going to know that I want to add it. You know, people have like, oh, I'm going to click a plus button. It's going to make a new thing for me to add. 
because they really want to try to avoid writing JavaScript. So now they're like writing client-side JavaScript through RJS because they really don't want to write JavaScript. And so they have to have the server and the client remember each other's state in JavaScript. And that's basically what ends up happening is that you have things that should be simple and stupid, client and server, uh, have to suddenly know all this information about each other. So probably the JS, right, if this is so simple, if this is so simple, the JavaScript to make that is probably like really hard, right? It actually turns out to not be really hard. Um, so this is making the AJAX call, you know, dollar get AJAX URL, and then you say function, and you just send back HTML, right? Which would be that. Wait, it would be that that li fox. So all you have to send back is just the li fox slash li, not like a big blob of JavaScript. And then you would just say append it to pound list. Um, so that's pretty much the story. It's, it, you need to get past the apparent fear that is JavaScript, right? It's pretty easy to be like, oh, it's JavaScript. It's a new thing. It, it's the assembler of the web. It's like, that really looks like assembler to me. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard that a lot. I've heard assembler of the web because I think a lot of people, it's like a sort of a tautology. Since a lot of people are compiling down to it, it obviously is the assembler of the web, right? But it's, in fact, uh, really, JavaScript is a really powerful dynamic language. Um, it's getting a lot, of, um, a lot of research into making dynamic languages fast. That is, I wish Ruby uh, had as much research into making dynamic languages fast as they are. They're like in a speed war. But it is, it is actually a dynamic language. Um, it's a little different because it's prototypal instead of object-oriented. Uh, but it's, it's strongly event-driven, so it's really easy to write modular code that is event-driven. So if you know anything about like Erlang or if you've heard of it, you can use a lot of the same techniques about modular Erlang code in the browser using event system. Um, and it's just not that scary, right? You, if you, the amount of code you have to write to do the thing in RJS is just not all that different from the amount of code you have to do to do it in JavaScript. And in fact, the JavaScript code is sometimes smaller. So I feel like if you're here, you're probably adequately on the edge that you can accept that you should learn JavaScript or know it, and that's pretty much the deal. You sh it's not hard. Um, you should, you're going to have to do some of it yourself, but if you assume that some, everybody else, I mean, it's really, the real bottom line is that it's not an 80-20 rule. It's actually not an 80-20 rule. Trying to figure out what everybody needs in the world, 80% of people in JavaScript is hard, and like the only good solutions are like GWT, right? So GWT, successfully does this. They allow you to write Java code that compiles down into every possible thing you'd need in JavaScript. And it's a pretty monstrous thing. Um, and RJS is not, like I'm not getting in the business of doing that. And RJS is just not even close to the business of doing that. Um, so getting even to the 80-20 rule is hard. And you don't want to get to the point where you have to cancel a launch because you have to go learn JavaScript to do something simple. So knowing JavaScript, knowing the web stack is a good thing. So. That's all, and I guess no JavaScript. That's good. I'll take any questions. <laughs> Are there no questions? Thanks, Yehuda. This may be outside of the scope of the presentation, but um, how to do specking, testing uh, on that front end with the JavaScript. I'm starting to get in the habit of wanting to use RSpec and BDD development methodologies. So that's cool. I'm it's not really outside of the scope at all, actually. Um, it's just outside. It's just not something that I had time for in a 20-minute talk. Um, I actually recently did a talk at, a not didn't go well, a talk at um, Lone Star in which I attempted to show how you would do that. There's a, a, something called Screw Unit, which was written by a guy named Nick Callen. Uh, basically, the idea was to port RSpec to JavaScript. Um, I did the initial implementation, um, and then he took it and ran with it and made a much better jQuery-based implementation that is cool. Um, it has stuff like before and after blocks and um, scoping describe blocks and stuff like that. And I added, uh, there's a thing in Merv plugins called Merv Screw Unit, which is still in a pretty larval state. But what it, it attempts to allow you to have a dollar in your inside of your specs that point to an iframe. So you can say, like, I want to test this URL. And then you could write specs in JavaScript RSpec style that run against it. And there's like a mocking framework for XHRs. I know I'm against mocking. But 
for um, XHRs, it turns out to be really tricky to do it right. So basically, you can say, um, hit this URL, and it will return back something and with this status code. And that way, you could avoid having to deal with having a server on that knows how to handle XHRs and return the right thing. Um, so I don't know. I would check out ScrewUnit. I would check out Merv ScrewUnit, which hopefully is going to get better. Other questions? Yes. So I'm going to play a little devil's advocate here. Um, this is in the back channel. Um, somebody mentioned that we use Ruby to generate SQL and Ruby to gen generate uh, HTML. So why not JavaScript? OK, that is a good question. So, so here's the problem. Um, SQL is actually a, SQL is a language that is a mismatch with what we're trying to do. Right? We have models which have associations in them, uh, belongs to, has many, has many through. And SQL has no mechanism in it for understanding those, those things. Uh, there's no, I, wish, I wish there was a version of SQL that understood associations with not as just foreign key constraints. But in SQL, there's no way to actually represent it. So coming up with a way to convert the way we think about, S, uh, about databases to SQL is hard. And it actually is possible to, to get easily to 80%, if not 90%. Right? And HTML. I don't, we don't really do that, but if we do like Haml, it's an extremely thin abstraction layer. Right? JavaScript is its own entire language that runs in the client that is running on a different place. Right? It's like on the client, has its own state. And every attempt so far that I've seen to do this, um, with the exception of like GWT, which is a monster code base, is not successful. Right? Because, sorry. Yeah, I don't. Do you want me to respond to Jabal? <laughs> yeah, maybe it will be cool. Um, the the problem with Jabal is similar to the problem with RJS, which is that it um, constrains your JavaScript to how Hampton writes JavaScript, right? So if you JavaScript, JavaScript is just is actually it's not like SQL. SQL is like a very DSL like language. JavaScript is maybe SQL is Turing complete, maybe. Somebody knows probably, but but JavaScript is like a computer programming language that you're, that is used in the client to do really powerful things. And I actually would say that if you're writing a web app, it's probably a good thing to have a person that knows how to write SQL on your team, right? Um, and if you're if you want to write if you want to do something like RJS, and then you know five minutes later when you realize it doesn't do everything you want, drop into raw JavaScript, and that's I guess fine. It's just that the barrier between the 80-20 rule with JavaScript is much closer to the beginning. And it's really, really scary when you fall off the cliff. So I don't know. I've personally experienced teams falling off the cliff, and it's just not fun. So, Hi. I was just going to ask, um, what's your opinion of Selenium testing? Um, how should that tie into the screw unit testing? Should you do both? Or like um, so I honestly haven't touched Selenium in a while. The last time I touched it, it was unpleasant to do the kind of full coverage testing that I wanted. So you could easily have it like go click on things and record things. And I remember it being brittle, but I don't remember. So I, I can't I don't know how it is today. Um, screw unit is a lot more like, okay, I am going to say if I hit if I click it, it does this. If I and then you can like have that really isolated test. Right? And then if I hit cancel it does this, really isolated test without having to do a whole bunch of stuff. I think Selenium is probably really good for acceptance testing if you would like have a human being doing it. Okay. Whereas screw unit is a way of doing the full stack testing that I normally advocate with a more unit testy kind of feel. Oh, I was just thinking because before in the other talk you mentioned that um, you're really big on you know testing the result of you know, right. what, basically testing what you care about, right? Yes. And I just I was just brought to mind Selenium because yes, it really so, does the, exactly that, right? You don't test any of the internals; it's completely black box. Assuming that Selenium isn't brittle, um, it's really cool. The only the difficulty of it is trying to make it test a lot of the things that you care about, um, which is why so screw unit and things like it let you still do the full stack. I actually have a page and I click on something and I wanted to do this without having to actually write. I don't know. Maybe it's possible to change significantly and it's really easy now. And if so, just do that. Thanks. Um, yeah, we're actually a screw unit shop. Um, we both use it and uh, Selenium at the same time. Like. Uh, suite sizes, uh, screen unit suites like 400 specs, and the Selenium suite is like 
less than 10. So it, it's like selenium is just very, very specialized stuff that we can't test any other way. Right. It's like if you would have a human being. Then right, you could right. Perhaps you, selenium you, like, and, and you can't test it any other way. Right. 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 Scrutiny essentially is like an R spec for JavaScript. It's exactly cool. what it is. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, do you have questions? Oh, someone does, in fact, have a question. I was just curious about the jQuery, Merb jQuery plugin, and I started using that. Um, it seems great just because it's just a little bit easier to keep your jQuery stuff with the same views that you, you know, are, are working on. But I don't know if, if there's any kind of best practice emerging with that. It doesn't seem to be a lot of you know, Google uh, stuff available on that. People aren't really talking about it too much, so. So yeah, the first, there's really two questions there. One is like, what's up with this Merv jQuery thing? And the other one is, should you put it into your view? Um, I'm okay with doing that in development mode. In production mode, there's all sorts of, you should really be able to cache JavaScript and other reasons that you wouldn't want to have it in your view. Uh, but I'm, I'm okay with that helper. I didn't write it. Um, and I don't personally do it that way, but I don't, I could see it okay in development to be like, oh, it's right here, I can easily change this. That's fine. Um, the question about Merv jQuery in general, like what's up with this, is that the answer is that we are, as we move forward, we're going to be adding new features to Merv that are really targeted towards rapid prototyping, getting up and running, Django-ish type things. And as we do that, um, there's going to have to be, we're going to have to figure out how to do it so that it's still pretty modular. Um, but we're going to do, we're going to end up having a lot more jQuery specific features in Merv jQuery. And I think the goal is going to be to be able to support prototype and move tools and whatever via the techniques that I was talking about earlier where you don't actually do any JavaScript specific things in the markup. Um, so the idea eventually, one example that I've thrown out that didn't end up making it to 1.0 but isn't very hard um, is to automatically have a form builder for jQuery that when you use it, it goes and says, oh, here you asked for this property and it has this constraint on it in the data mapper model. Add the client side validation automatically. Right? That's pretty easy. Um, I also want to add, we just haven't gotten to it before one. So it'll probably be there in like 1.1 one, one or 1.2 one, or something. Um, and then another thing I really want to do is I want to be able to let you say like break or Thor, jQuery colon install autocompleter or tabs or something and have it automatically go get the, Java, the JavaScript, CSS, and images. Um, rewrite the CSS so that it points to the right images place, put everything in the right place, and maybe tell you what you need to put in your layout. Um, so, so, like, stuff like that just to make it, I was just at a conference, a jQuery camp, like, last week, and we were talking about making it easier to package jQuery. So, Merb jQuery is, is probably going to drive the effort of making it easy to package and install jQuery on things like Merb. Maybe it'll only ever be Merb, but I, that's probably the biggest pain point that I personally have with jQuery since I know JavaScript, is just being able to be like, OK, I want tabs. OK, where, how do I, where do I get it from? And like, where does the files go? OK, I have to go into the CSS and like modify the relative URLs. And there's a bunch of duplication you have to do over and over that would be nice to be able to solve. So I don't know, this is probably going to be a smorgasbord of, of nice integration points. And we're going to try to encourage people that care about prototype to, to pick up the ball and do that. Cool. All right.